Uh, well, now after the lunch, I hope you will somehow manage to remain uh, attentive <laughs> as, as until now, uh, because I'm glad to present uh, Dr. Katrin Peterson, uh, who is a practitioner, uh, an actual practitioner of European law, uh, which is actually exactly what I had in mind for this topic, so we are really glad to have her here. Uh, and she will present uh, some thoughts about influence of EU law on national procedural rules. Please, Dr. Peterson, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, so um, well, the presentation I've prepared for you is sort of um, a basic overview over um, the different general principles of EU law that actually have an influence on national procedural rules. Um, because, as you all might know, there is no EU procedural uh, system or no harmonization of procedural rules in the EU. So, um, uh, yeah, we have to yeah. refer to, to some, some basic principles. No, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. That's no, no, that's okay. okay. Um, yeah, maybe in addition to the very kind introduction I, I just received, I, I just wanted to say um, I work um, in the German Ministry um, of Economics, which might seem a bit strange to you, but um, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, together with the Foreign Office, is charged with the coordination of EU politics in Germany. And as such, we have a unit for legal representation of Germany before the European courts. And that's the unit that I work in. So I work like sort of a lawyer for Germany, but, but in all sorts of different branches of law, in a way. So we cooperate tightly together with the ministries responsible, ex for example, with finance and taxes or for justice things and like this and other things, but we, we cover almost all of it. So I'm rather a generalist, so um, if there's any details you want to know, we can try and figure them out, but I'm not a judge, I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, how do I move this forward? Just uh, by this. Yes. Yeah. And um, to give you an impression <coughs> of the, the, the way how um, EU law influences national procedural rules, I thought I'd give you a quick overview first of the big pr principle that procedural rules still remain national law and that there is no comprehensive harmonization in the EU. Then, as a second topic, the principle of non-discrimination on grounds of nationality, which we find in all the fundamental freedoms of the EU treaty, and which, of course, also apply to procedural rules, not only to substantive contractual law or criminal law, but, of course, also to procedural rules. They must not discriminate um, on grounds of nationality. And then I'll introduce shortly into the fundamental right to efficient judicial protection, that the ECJ quite often refers to when he makes his judgments about how procedural law is influenced by European law. And in the end, or like my main focus will be on the principle of cooperation uh, written in Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the TFEU, um, which is mostly used by the European Court to, to um, found its judgments. Yeah. And should should any one of the other speakers have touched these topics, please um, raise a hand and tell me, and then I won't bore you to death with that. And uh, yeah, since we're a bit late, we run out of time, I try. No, no, Maybe no, no, I, I no. skip some things and then, because I also have prepared a case study, but we can see whether we come to that or you might read it yourself and then um, think, oh, oh, I could have found the solution myself because I think you can solve it just by reading this material here. Um, yeah, first thing, just as an introduction, as I already said, um, there is no comprehensive harmonization of, of procedural rules in, in, in the EU. And I think this will, for quite a while, remain like this because um, there is no legal basis for comprehensive harmonization in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So we have um, Article 81 for harmonization in civil matters. We have Article 82 for the harmonization in criminal matters like as regards procedural routes. And um, when you read those articles, you will find that there's really a restricted area of, attributed, uh, of powers attributed to the EU. It's not 
all, kind, all, all, the, all the branch of um, procedural law, but certain aspects, like mostly the mutual recognition of justice and judicial decisions and certain types of settlement procedures and so on. So it's, they, harmonization goes step by step in a very limited area of, of fields. Um, yeah, and if there should be harmonization um, by directives or framework decisions, you should mm. already find those rules in your national legal systems because they have to be implemented by a national law. So you, maybe you won't even be aware of them, that they are there actually. This cannot be read, but it's not supposed to be read. Um, it's just an enumeration of a lot of acts of harmonization that have been passed. But you can read it in your spare time if you seek for something special. It's just an expression of what I just said. It's, it's a lot of directives or regulations in the field of um, recognition of judgments and so on. Yeah? Can I just uh, ask something? If, are those the most important ones or are they just the list of the day? That's what I think is quite important and yeah, relevant. That's lovely because that, uh, I, I but I'm not sure. I, I think it's not, I, it's not, a numer uh, not exhaustive. But, um, but the most important. I would say, and I couldn't, there are some things still in work. There's a legal package in criminal matters, I think, uh, on its way, and um, also some, t some new things in the field of civil law and testimonial law, I think, but um, I couldn't get it on the, on the screen. So, um, yeah, just to give you an Im impression. So, conclusion is, procedural law largely remains in the hands of the member states. And uh, what a surprise, also the, the European Court has uh, stated this and has detected that it is like this in the, in the year 1976 when he said, and I might just read this out to you, um, what I've, I've written on, on, the, um, on the PowerPoint presentation, um, applying the principle of cooperation laid down in Article 5 of the treaty, I will come to that later, it is the national courts which are entrusted with ensuring the legal protection which citizens derive from the direct effect of the provisions of community law. So he says it's the national courts who have to make sure that EU law is really observed in their national system. And in the absence of community rules governing the matter, it is for the domestic legal system of each member state to designate the courts and tribunals having jurisdiction and to lay down the detailed procedural rules governing actions for safeguarding rights which individuals derive from community law. So that's a basic principle that has been um, accepted. And this is a phrase that is always repeated in the judgment of the court. So whenever there's a question whether procedural law is actually now really co complying with EU law and ensuring the people's rights derived from EU rules, it's this is repeated. <coughs> Any questions to this? No, I hope not. So, um, yeah, and uh, regarding the basic principles or uh, fundamental uh, principles of, of primary law that have an effect on the national procedure rules, it's on the first hand the principle of non-discrimination that has an influence on national procedural uh, law. Um, this is hard to read, I think, but um, I'll just try to explain that to you. Um, I will present to you three decisions where the Court of Justice has expressly stated that national procedural rules do also fall within the scope of EU law in a way, and that they have to have to um, respect the principle of non-discrimination on the grounds of nationality. And one of them is case C20 of the year 92 called Hubbard, where Mr. Hubbard, it's an old case, but um, still it's, it's quite good to use it as an example. Mr. Hubbard was an English solicitor who uh, who, who um, brought an action before the German courts in his capacity as an executor of a will, right? Somebody had died, so he brought an action for to, to get some property um, which was located in Germany. So he brought an action before the German courts. And um, the, um, the defendant said, well, before you can bring an action, you will have to give us security for the costs of the lawyers. 
<coughs> and indeed, there was a German rule in national procedure law which stated that foreigners who were not national, uh, a German national, uh, not of German nationality, would have to give security, um, just because of that. And uh, and the court held that this was not okay. Well, in this case, since uh, Mr. Hubbard worked as a lawyer or as, as an executor, it was the freedom of services which was at stake, because normally everybody should be able to provide his services in another member state at the, at the same conditions as the nationals there. And, um, but he was forced to, to give security. And um, yeah, the court said that this freedom of services was violated. And I, I read it out again. He, the court held that the fact that a member state requires security for costs to be given by a national of another member state who in its capacity as an executor has brought an action before one of its courts, while its own nationals are not subject to such a requirement, constitutes discrimination on grounds of nationality, contrary to Articles 59 and 60 EEC Treaty, which is now 49 TFEU. So, um, and there was no ground of justification why this the security should be demanded of foreign nationals, so this regulation had to be set aside by the courts and could not be applied any longer. Um, there's also some other statements the court made in this case, but they are not so interesting, um, amongst which he said, um, for example, like the, the, um, the, I don't know whether it was the German government or maybe the, the, the um, <coughs> maybe it was the German government who said like, but well, this is, this is security, and th this whole um, proceedings is dealing about the law of succession, which is not harmonized. It's procedural law, and in, in, in the field of succession, you cannot do anything about this European court. But he said, no, that doesn't matter. It's procedural law, and um, the freedom of services is, is violated here. The next case is quite a basic case, too. It's a bit similar to the, to the first case. It's, it's called Data Delecta. It's a Swedish case, and here it's a bit the same. Um, here it wasn't a, a lawyer or a pr an executor who brought an action before the German, uh, the Swedish courts, but it was just a normal, a normal company, which brought an action for the payment of um, for the supply of goods. They just wanted to get the money for the supply of goods, and again the defendant said, well, due to Swedish uh, procedural law, you have to provide security for the costs of the lawyers, and. Um, there again, the question was whether this was discrimination or not. And in this case, it was not, um, it was not the freedom of services that could be violated because the supply of goods was no, 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 um, freedom of, not, uh, no supply of services. And the court had to analyze what other freedom could be violated or how this, this case could fall into the scope of EU law. And... Um, I can read that from your material later, maybe because it's quite a lot of that I've written on this this presentation. But um, in the end, they found that um, how can I say it? It is enough that intra-community trade is touched in this case. It is a a, a, tra a case just about somebody supplying goods to somebody else within the EU in the common market, and this link would be enough that the general principle of non-discrimination um, of Ar um, Article 6 in those days, now it's Article 18, can apply. And so, again, this, um, this uh, national rule that's, that said that um, a foreign national had to give security <coughs> constituted discrimination and would have to be, um, couldn't be applied any longer, right? So this is, if you read a bit into them, um, it's, it's quite similar cases. And the last case is, is again, um, a case of discrimination. Mm. Mund and Fenster was a case where um, a German company claimed damages against a Dutch carrier called Hartex, who had transported hazelnuts, hazelnuts for them from Turkey to Hamburg. 
And the hazelnuts were damaged in the transit because they got moist on the lorry. So, um, okay, MNF brought an action and uh, wanted, wanted um, damages for this. And because they were quite afraid they wouldn't get their money, because this was a Dutch company and MNF was a German company, they said, we, we would like an order for seizure of the lorries to have them as a security, you know, because the, the lorries were still in Germany and Hamburg. And, um, and in effect, there was a, procedure, a rule in, in German procedural rule uh, law that said, okay, um, in cases where an action is brought against a foreign national, you might seize, get, a, get an order for seizure because there's a risk that you won't get your money from that one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, assuming that the risk for reclaiming money abroad is always bigger than it is at home. Um, and the court said, no, that's not okay. Because, well, if you regard purely internal cases in Germany, you have a lot of conditions that have to be fulfilled because before somebody gets an order for seizure, right? There has to be a real risk that you won't get your money and yeah, you have to prove that and all sort of things. So you cannot just assume because the defendant is a foreigner that you can seize his lorries. So also this, also nice German reg regulations had to be, uh, could not be applied after that any longer. Yeah. So this is just a few things. I, I hope that doesn't exist in other, in, in the national procedural rules so, so many anymore, but still there can, you, might find some discriminative rules there, I think. Could I just ask you, uh, this principle of non-discrimination, would it mean that uh, one could claim legal aid as a non-national non of the, the forum in the country where one wishes to bring a civil action? Normally, I think, well, at least, I don't know any cases of that. I'm sorry, I know there is some sort of harmonization on that. Uh, like actually, we had to alter our statute on legal aid in order to accommodate foreign nationals uh, requesting legal aid under the same uh, conditions as our own nationals. So the answer is yes. That's a Slovenian opinion anyway. No, that was, if I remember correctly, the opinion of the Commission and we, oh, right. uh, we complied. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, otherwise you, you, you would have to find a, um, an objective reason why you can't grant it to people of foreign nationality, and I think that could be difficult in a way. So, and, um, and I also read, like, in my, my list of um, harmonization acts, I think there is one which says there is sort of minimum harmonization on, on access to legal aid, but to be honest, I haven't read that one, so I don't know what is written in it, but that's maybe Neither going even... <laughs> A step further, but yeah, yeah. So there's still actual problems yeah. with discrimination going on. Yeah, um, but yeah, the question of discrimination is just one field, and there's. Um, the, but the, the, the main question which always arises before the court, the, the European court, is whether the national courts have really done enough to help the people enforce the rights that they derive from a EU. EU directive or EU regulation or wherever from. So, um, and that's the basic question, how can, what does a judge have to do? How can he decide whether he's really giving the effet utile um, to, to those um, rights granted to the individual? And um, yeah, if, if uh, one of the basic principles that the court applies when he, say, when he, he makes his judgment on this topic, is the, the right to effective judicial protection. That's one right he or quite often refers to. And I think, um, well, the one of you who are experts in, in, uh, in fundamental freedoms and human rights might know it anyway, because it's a right this, which is um, written down both in the European Charter of um, Fundamental Laws and also in, uh, in the European Charter of Human Rights. Um, it's written down in Article 40, 47, which states that everyone whose rights and freedoms guaranteed by the law of the Union uh, are violated has a right to an effective remedy before a tribunal in compliance with the conditions laid down in this article. And yeah, if you 
compared to Article 13 and the European Charter of Human Rights, which is sort of the basis for the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which only affects to, uh, applies to the European Union, the wording is almost the same. Apart from the fact that um, in Article 47 of the European Charter, they say um, an effective remedy before a tribunal, and in Article 30, it's before a national authority, mm -hmm. which could also be something different. But um, uh, this is just a this is just as a note because I think we will have a separate lecture on how the the European Charter of, of um, fundamental laws is applied. This will be um, the topic of a separate le <coughs> lecture. But just to remind you, the court can also only um, refer to this this fundamental right to an effective remedy when the scope of the treaty is open, the scope of U European Union law is open. If you, have a, if you deal with a purely national um, action before your court, then and, and no EU law is implied, uh, is, is affected, then of course the European Charter of Human Rights doesn't apply, right? It's, then it's your, your own constitution and your own fundamental laws that you would have to apply in your judgment. <coughs> but. Um, <coughs> As soon as as um, as the um, the as European law is implemented or executed, then the European Charter and those fundamentals of freedoms would apply. And this that would be a case when the the court can actually hold a judgment on how you 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 have to give effect on on European law. And this is well, this is on the on the one hand written in, in Article 51 of the European Charter. And it's also written in Article 6 of the Treaty of the European Union, which also said that the, the Charter of, the U of, of um, Fundamental Rights shall not extend in any way the competences of the Union. So this is just to remind you that it's not a universal right, but only apl applicable in the field where European law is implemented. And maybe one more note on this. Um, Oh, I've, I've just said that um, the, the compa compared to Article 13 of the, the European um, Charter of Human Rights, the European, oh, I got the names wrong, didn't I? The European the Charter, oh. the EU Charter, I call it like that, is, is even <coughs> more restrictive and even grants you in this effective remedy before a court. So it's, it's even more intense, the protection granted there. And what one had, would keep also in mind is that um, the, the right to an effective judicial remedy has always been a, a general principle of union law. It's, it hasn't been introduced with the charter, but has always been in the jurisdiction of the, of the ECJ. So there's a lot of cases on this topic, which, uh, which uh, a lot of judgment which have been given even before the charter had been um, developed and had become a source of law in European law. Um, but, and this is the end of this chapter of my speech, uh, so the, the, the European court tends to mix the two sources. When he holds his judgments, he, he on the one hand refers to Article 47, paragraph 1 of the European Charter, and on the other hand, he refers to, to the fact that, um, to, to the general principle of community law that he has developed in, er, in a very early case. And um, yeah, I can read, read that out to you. It's, he, he always uses to formulate, it is to be noted at the outset that according to settled case law, the principle of effective judicial protection is a general principle of community law stemming from the constitutional traditions common to the member state which has been enshrined in Article 6 and 30 of the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and which has also been reaffirmed by Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So this is the abstract background of all the judgments in a way. And I skip the next one. Of course, there are more fundamental rights in the European Charter that you will probably learn of in one of the next sessions, such as the right to a fair trial, the, ri um, the, the right to a fair and public hearing um, before an independent and impartial tribunal, and as you just mentioned, also the right to legal aid uh, somehow um, has a basis in, uh, or a certain source in the, in the European Charter. So, um, but I won't deal with this here in the speech now any longer. But you can find, if you seek for something, you just seek in the Charter, you find a lot. 
Um, the main principle that the European Court uses when he makes its judgments on, on national procedural rules and on the question whether EU law is being implemented effectively by the courts is the principle of cooperation, which is uh, written down in Article 4.3 of the Treaty on the European Union. And I think you, well, all of you have learned about this in, uh, at, at university and, and, and know it already, that um, it's also a principle that the European Court um, applies when he, when he examines whether the administrative authorities have, are implementing EU law in the right way. So this is sort of a universal principle he always uses. Uh, and he has, like the first case where he really has um, relied on it was in the case 33 of 76, Rewe, which I just read out to you because it's also um, a sentence that he always repeats all the times in his judgment. And I've, I've already re read out part of it. Under the principle of cooperation laid down in Article 5 of the treaty, it is for the member states to ensure the legal protection which individuals derive from the direct effect of community law. And then blah, blah, blah. Again, he says it's the domestic legal system um, that, that fixes the procedural rules. But in that regard, the detailed procedural rules governing actions for safeguarding an individual's rights under community law must be no less favorable than those governing similar domestic actions that's the principle of equivalence, and must not render practical impossible or excessively difficult the exercises of rights confirmed by community law, uh, confirmed by community law, that's the principle of effectiveness. So he has derived two principles from the principle of co uh, cooperation, or like two criteria that he always applies when he examines whether um, a procedural rule or a behavior of a national court corresponds with EU law. Um, one of which is the principle of equivalence and the other of which is the principle of effectiveness. Um, yeah, and I, I've, I've put a quotation of, of the, the case 432.05 Unibet as well because sometimes in addition he refers to the European Charter or to the, to the right to an effective judicial remedy but it's, it's mostly this cooperation principle that the court uses. And um, so the question is, well, or what, what I will try to, to explain to you before I give you some examples, which is maybe easier to, to make you understand what exactly the, the court rules and is, um, well, on the first hand, the judge has to, um, how can a, can a national judge um, find out whether the procedural rule he applies in a EU law case is really equivalent to the to the to the one that he applies in purely domestic cases. It's normally that should be an easy question. You would think, like um, if there's, for example, if there's a time limit, yeah, you say there's a time limit for bringing actions of say one year or two year. Of course, you you should apply it to both cases. Whether somebody ha is bringing in an action which is based on purely national, say contractual law, or or, the, or whether he's relying on a clause on. Um, unfair term and um, tra uh, unfair terms clause, um, which is um, governed by an EU directive, should be the same. But in some <coughs> cases, the the national laws, for some reason, use different time limits. For example, or they sometimes even yeah do it expressly. It's it's rare, but those cases do exist. And uh, yeah, I won't go too much in depth with this, but. Um, the ECJ says, well, I cannot give you too much guidance on the questions whether you, you apply your law in a non-discriminative way, but I can just give you some criteria, he says. So um, the, the National Court has to make um, an abstract comparison of the two procedural rules that he applies and then see whether they are, they are the same or he's treating the, uh, the, the people the same way. Um, yeah, and I just maybe read this out to you so that you can have an 
idea of what the what the court says. Um, oh, this was actually this was in a case. The case Preston was a case, for example, about um, sex discrimination. Somebody was bringing a claim that he he wasn't given access to a pension scheme because um, because um, of uh, he was a part-time worker. So he, he brought a claim based on sex dis uh, discrimination and relied on a European directive or like on Article 119 e, um, EU treaty. And, um, but the, the um, English law fixed a, a time limit for those claims of exactly one year. And had the claim been brought purely under domestic law, I think there was a right to non-sex uh, discrimination in the UK even before the EU law had been um, uh, came into force, there would have been a different time limit of, I don't know, th three or more years. And um, there the court says, well, first you have to, it's a two-step approach. Like, um, first you have to find out whether those two uh, time limits are similar, <coughs> and then the next time, next step you have to find out whether you apply them without distinction. And I just read this out because it's really complicated. Um, so the principle of equivalence requires that the rule at issue be applied without distinction, whether the infringement alleged is of community law or national law, whether purpose and cause of action are similar. In order to determine whether the principle of equivalence has, um, has been complied with in the present case, the national court must consider both the purpose and the essential characteristics of allegedly similar domestic actions. So you have to compare the type of actions. And in order to decide whether procedural rules are equivalent, it is necessary to verify objectively in the abstract whether the rules at issue are similar, taking into account the role played by them in the procedure as a whole, as well as the operation of that procedure and any special feature of the rules. So it's a very comprehensive approach. And in the end, the court mostly leaves it to the national courts. So this is very difficult. I think I, I rather skip this, but just to, to, to let you know how this works. Um, oh, I don't know, shall I say something on the next case? Um, yeah, the other, the, the next cases I've, I've, you might be interested in reading is, um, mm, like in Palmisani, for example, um, the, the plaintiff demand, uh, demanded damages for the belated implementation of an EU directive. And um, there was a sp it was an Italian case, and they, mm, the, the government said, okay, we've implemented the, the directive belatedly. So we, they, they made a decree, and they said, okay, you can claim damages for this under, under the Frankovic regime, but it's one year you have to bring the claims. Whereas in the ordinary system of um, non-contractual liability for damages, people had five years to bring a claim. So this was quite, yeah, here you could really see the difference of time limits in a way. And here um, the court again said you, you really, but the ECJ didn't really say itself whether there was a discrimination or not, but again he said, well, you have to compare whether under those normal rules where you have the five years you could have you could have claimed damages from the government, so whether these would really have been the same type of action. I think, I don't know, I don't know the outc outcome of the case, but um, yeah, so this is boring, we go on to the next principle, which is much more important, is the principle of efficiency. Um, well, you all know the, 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 the uh, principle of the effet utile, so um, that, um, <coughs> The, the national authorities and courts have to, to apply EU law as efficiently as possible, and they are not allowed to, to render it extremely difficult to, to invoke the, the individual rights that one has gotten from, uh, from EU law. And uh, well efficiency is, is, is a different approach, but when you when you uh, find out whether you are really efficiently um, applying EU law, you, you use a different test. You don't make an abstract comparison, whatever, of, of the purely domestic case or the EU case, but you rather make it on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, 
you have mm. a look at whether how you apply a rule in the procedure with whether this is really making whether you ins, ins, for some reason make it impossible for the for the plaintiff to to, to invoke his right and you al always have to to weigh the EU right or the EU interests with other with other domestic principles of law like legal certainty and other things you always have to to weigh them out and uh, I will show it on, 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 uh, from some examples to you um, in order to find the solution when that whether you really render it too difficult for somebody to bring an action or not. And um, where the ECJ always says, um, for the purposes of applying those principles, each case which raises the question whether a national procedural provision renders application of community law impossible or excessively difficult must be analyzed by reference to the role of that provision in the procedure its progress and its special features viewed as a whole before the various national instances. In the light of that analysis, the basic principle of the domestic judicial system, such as protection of the rights of the defense, the principle of legal certainty and the proper conduct of procedure must, where appropriate, be taken into consideration. So this is a bit abstract, but I will explain that to you um, uh, using some examples. For example, if we take application deadlines yeah as I just said if you have an application deadline that you want to apply in your national proceedings one question can be well one of the the things you have to examine is whether you apply exactly the same time limits like then in purely domestic cases that was the principle of adequacy but and then you also have to to verify whether the time limit is long enough and reasonable or whether the time limit is so short that in fact nobody can bring an action and enforces EU laws, right? So if, it, if the time limit makes it virtually impossible for somebody to bring a claim and invoke his rights that he gained under a directive or somewhere, then you have a problem and you have to set aside that rule. You cannot apply it. And um, yeah, I, I will give you some examples, one of which the easiest ones, or which is mostly dealt with in the EU cases, is um, application deadlines. In the case that I, s that I cited at first hand, the, the early Rewe case, 33 of 76, the court has declared time <coughs> limits as being okay and <coughs> compatible with EU law. He said, I, I have no problem with time limits as long as they are reasonable. So he always says, and this is also a sentence that he would always repeat in, in his judgment. Mm. So he says, time limits are okay. The position would be different only if the conditions and time limits made it impossible in practice to exercise the rights which the national courts are obliged to protect. This is not the case where reasonable periods of limitation of actions are fixed. Mm -hmm. The laying down of such time limits with regard to actions of a fiscal nature is an application of the fundamental principle of legal certainty, protecting both the taxpayer and the administration concerns. So that was a, a, a case about taxes, but he said, it's fine if you fix time limits because there's also a general principle recognized. That we, on the one hand, you have the principle of cooperation and um, the right to an effective remedy, right, which should would speak against the time limit, but on the other hand, you have the principle of legal certainty, like that after a while, it should be calm and people sh should no longer be entitled to bring an action. And these two principles that are recognized by EU law have to be weighed. So a time limit is okay because it serves the purpose of legal certainty in the end. There must be a day where it, nobody goes before the courts anymore. So, but um, the right to an effective remedy and the principle of cooperation say, but the time limit must be long enough, right? So, um, and so like in the Rewe case, or in most of the cases, the, the ECJ says, okay, time limits are okay, but there are a few cases which I've cited at the bottom, like the case Leven, Santex, Codifus, where due to the circumstances circumstances of the case at, at issue, time limits did not satisfy the principle of efficiency and could not be justified on the grounds of legal certainty. So it's always a case-by-case case analysis. You can never be sure, right? So <laughs> um, 
but there's uh, loads of judgment on this, so we can find a lot of precedents, maybe for the individual case you have. Um, there's another principle that the ECJ has has um, has recognized, which is a bit similar to time limits, and that's the principle of res judicata. So. If somebody wants to bring a claim and say, I want to enforce my right under a directive, say under the unfair contract terms directive, and you say, but well, you have already brought it before the courts and I don't know, you pleaded so badly, it is, it is decided already, you cannot bring it any again, right? It's, it's definite, you have gone to the appellate courts and you have, um, you have climbed all the judicial ladder to the top and now it's decided. Sorry, you cannot bring a new action which is a principle which I think is, 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 um, is exists in, in all, all sorts of national uh, procedural laws. The, the court has also said, that's okay. I accept this principle that after a while or after somebody, after the courts have, 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 have taken a decision, um, it, there's, um, you cannot bring a new action anymore. So he said, like in the case Kapfara, he said, in that regard, attention should be drawn to the importance of the principle of res judicata. In order to ensure both stability of the law and legal relations and the sound administration of justice, it is important that judicial decisions which have become definitive after all rights of appeal have, ex have been exhausted or after expiry of time limits can no longer be called into question. Therefore, community law does not require a national court to disapply domestic rules of procedure conferring finality on a decision. And, um, but again, there's also an exemption like the case Kühne and Heitz there, that he said it differently, but that was a case which um, concerned um, ad administrative authority, not a court, and they had to, to reopen the procedure after a while. Um, yeah, in order not to bore you to death, this is just quick. Um, of course, there are also judgments of, on the taking of evidence. Of course, you, you could imagine there could be procedural rules which are so strict that uh, nobody um, who's, that, that people who, who want to enforce their rights that they, uh, that they have been given under EU law virtually have no chance to bring them. Um, that's the, in this San Giorgio case, um, um, there was um, the cla the um, uh, the appellant or the, the claimant was um, imported dairy products from from abroad within the common market, and he had to pay inspection charges. And the court had found that these inspection charges uh, were levied in breach of EU law; that the national authorities shouldn't have levied them. And um, but the national procedural law said, well. You will not be th those charges will not be paid back um, if if they have been passed on to the consumer. You know, then you won't get them back. That was a rule like that, and we pres we presume that in your case that they have been passed on to the consumer, and we won't allow any sort of evidence except for formal documentation. And if you we can't um, you, you can't prove it from your books that you haven't passed these charges to the consumers and the price that you love it for your goods, then, well, you won't get anything. And there the court said, mm, that's a bit too strict, right? You, you shouldn't presume in such a case that, that somebody is not entitled to get the charges because they have been levied in breach of EU law. And you should also let him bring other sort of evidence, like, I don't know, people giving oral <laughs> evidence or other things to, to um, to prove his rights and to to and to to enable him to to uh, to um, bring an action for the charges to get them back. It's always a bit complicated cases, but um, I think what what is the most important aspect is um, the right, uh, yeah, access to the courts. Um, since, yeah, we, we've learned that the EU law confers, confers to you a fundamental right to on an effective remedy. And also there's the principle of cooperation. And by both principles, um, uh, what can I say? 
there must be a legal remedy against administrative uh, decisions which refuse the, you a right that you might have derived from EU law. So you must, in effect, have some sort of possibility to bring a legal action. Like in the case of Highlands, it was quite obvious that this was not the case. There was a Belgian football trainer who held a diploma for football trainers under Belgian law. And he was working in France. He wanted to, he applied for, um, for recognition of his Belgian diploma, which was denied by a very strange special committee, football committee, which said, oh no, we don't recognize your, your diploma. I don't know why. They didn't give a reason and they did not, um, and there was also no legal remedy against this. So that was final in the end. And uh, so he brought an action for the, um, based on the freedom of workers. And the ECJ said, well, yes, uh, so this right is at stake because this is a classical case. Somebody wants to go to another member state and work there. And um, he holds some sort of diploma. You should normally verify whether this is equivalent of the national diplomas. And he says that um, the existence of a remedy of a judicial nature against any decision of a national authority refusing the benefit of that right is essential in order so to secure for the individual effective protection for his right. So that's quite obvious. Um, I think I will skip the next one. This is quite, yeah, no, this is not so interesting. <coughs> There's another case, which is also quite Rewe, where the court limited this judgment that he just made, that he says, of course, mm, on the one hand, of course, everybody needs a legal remedy against decision where he is refused a right under EU law. But, and this is quite interesting, um, it was not, under the treaties, it was not intended to create new remedies in the national court. So you don't have to invent something just to enable somebody to bring in actions. So it was not intended to create new remedies in the national courts to ensure the observance of community law other than those already laid down by national law. So if there's a certain catalog of actions that somebody can bring against some administrative decision or whatever, under, a tree, under contract law or whatever, then um, it is enough to apply those rules to the EU cases. Right? Um, just make it the same way and apply them effectively. And you don't have to create new legal ma remedies just because somebody is invoking EU law. Um, this would only be the case if there were no legal remedies at all in your national legal order, but mostly this is not the case. So um, you can stick to your normal rules of procedure that you have present before you and um, you just have to apply them effectively and read everything possible into them and uh, have in, keep in mind that there are community interests at stake. Um, yeah, that's what, what the court says too. Um, it must be possible for every type of action provided for by national law to be available for the purpose of ensuring observance of community provisions. So apply them in the same, under the same conditions. Mm. That's a bit abstract still, isn't it? Okay, but just to give you an, an impression. Um, in order not to have too much, I skipped the next few parts. This is an excursus. Well, as I, as I just said, I won't get into depth here, but um, all these judgments that the court makes regard, uh, referring to the principle of efficiency of course, um, relate well, well. The precondition for all these cases is that you ha you are granted a right under EU law, right? As soon as you have an individual right, the courts have to imply it uh, effectively, uh, implement it effectively. And so, another means of extending extending access to the courts is to extend extend the notion of the uh, individual right you get from EU law, right? If you have a broad notion of this then uh, the, there are more cases where you, where you have to, um, where the court have really, uh, have a problem with, uh, yeah, have to, to, to implement it effectively. 
And it's, I think, well, the, the ones of you who work in the field of administrative law might have noticed that the notion of, an of getting an individual right under EU law where you have to get um, a legal remedy and access to the courts, this precondition, uh, is given in quite a lot of cases. It's not only, um, yeah, I just enumerated some cases here. It's, um, sometimes the, the court even says where you would normally read from a directive that it concerns only public interests. You think, well, but can an individual rely on these public interests to bring an action before the courts? Like in the field of um, emissions, for example, here in this case, like um, environmental law, the, where the directives say something about public health and well, things, interests that should be um, protected, can somebody really bring an action on this basis? Um, there the court is quite generous and says yes. Yeah, People can be, well, as, as long as it is, um, it is possible that they are concerned or that there's a risk for their health, they are pri individually concerned and they must be able to bring an action before the court. So mm -hmm. he has a very wide notion. And in this case, he, it was sufficient to relate on, on, on health, yeah, or the, that one is interested in, in, in clean drinking water or whatever. So, but this is quite sp special to administrative law. Or here in the case, um, WW, World Wildlife Fund, um, the, the court even said, okay, um, this was a, a case about, ooh, ooh, ooh. oh, yeah, that's, that's maybe going a bit too far, where, where um, member states were forced to draw up, where they had before like planning an airport, allowing an airport to be built, so they have to make an um, examination of the environmental impact, impact of all that. And they have procedural obligations to, to make a report and to prove all that and so on. And then the court has even said, oh, with this grants an individual right to the people living there, so can, they can bring an action before the courts. So, or in the directives 96 of 91 and this other one I, I, I mentioned there, like some environmental uh, directives, they, they even give legal standing to, um, to uh, non-governmental organizations. So, this also has an impact of how the courts are affected. The, normally you would say like, okay, I haven't got this, those people would have no, act, no standing in my legal procedure, but EU law says, well, you have to admit uh, an NGO in your action, right? So that can be the case, but this is only exceptional cases. So, uh -uh. Um, I think from the next, I just deal with the first case. The court has also dealt with the, the density of control that the, 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 the judges, oh, as, as to the way how the national judge has to review the administrative acts or whatever, um, how, how intensely the, the judicial review has to be. Um, so not only about procedures and things like time limits and so on, but also how deep does the judge really have to go into the topic and have to really check whether EU law is really being implemented well or not. And um, there he says, um, in, in this case, von Scheindl, he, um, this was, this was a case um, where a Dutch case about the compulsory membership of, of physiotherapists in a pension scheme. And the two plaintiffs said, we don't want to be a member of this pension scheme, we want an exemption from this. And they relied on an exemption clause in that national scheme, like for certain types of practitioners who would have some other, a member of some other pension scheme, you're allowed to an exemption, <coughs> but they failed with this, relying on this in the courts. They, this argument was so bad they didn't, um, they, they didn't get the exemption. And then in the end, after that, oh, they found, oh, maybe we have a right granted under EU law. Um, this whole pension scheme violates the principle of, um, of, uh, of uh, Article 101 TFEU of, of um, the, the principles of free competition, you know? 
So they invoked European community at a very late stage of procedure. And, uh, and they relied on new facts. They said, oh, this pension scheme works like this and this. It's not comparable on the market. It's funded by some state money and whatever. So um, the, in this case, the court accepted that um, it is okay if the courts say, well, it's too late. You should have brought that in the action immediately. And after a certain stage, we will just stick to the facts that you brought in your action. <coughs> and um, you cannot bring forward new arguments. So although this is sort of limiting the, the, the EU rights conferred on, on an individual, it's, it's accepted as a basic principle of national procedural law that after a while, especially in civil suits, where I think in all, in all um, domestic systems, it is up to the parties to, to bring forward the arguments and to bring forward the facts, right? You don't have to, to research on your own as a judge. You just wait what is presented to you. And that's okay, the, the court accepts that. Mm. Uh, Upton is quite, is, is similar. Uh, How long do we, shall we stop at four? Mm -hmm. And shall uh, I go s be quick now and make my little uh, case study? Yes, perhaps, yeah? uh, even though we started late. So if you wish, we uh, may stop uh, some minutes after four. Okay, then we do it like that. Then I, I skip the next ones. Th the next two cases were also on something like that. And um, how deep does the judge have to get into, uh, have to control if, if EU mm -hmm. law is at stake? and. Uh, you, you, you should maybe read that um, by yourself. <laughs> um, for example, he says, well, the judge, I it is okay if a national authority has a certain margin of discretion in complicated decisions and a judge does not have re to replace his own or d does not have to replace the complicated um, assessment made by a national authority by his own assessment. So you can, s you can verify whether everything's found it well, the reasons are well, whatever, you don't have to do everything yourself as a judge. You stick to your normal procedure as you always examine administrative decisions, whatever. But what I would like to go to is the question of interim measures. That's quite, um, that's a topic that is also dealt with in the DigiBed case that we're going to treat. Uh, I think in all, the, all fields of law, like in, uh, in, in administrative procedure also, uh, as well as in the civil procedures, there's, in most national legal orders, there's a means of getting interim relief. So you bring your main action, maybe for getting back your money for the delivery of goods that you had. And, um, but because you're afraid that you will um, suffer irreparable damage because you won't be paid or so, so you want interim relief. You want to get some quick judgment now, just by, a, with, with, yeah, by the weighing the interests. And, um, and then the main decision will be taken later in the main proceedings. Um, normally, I think that the, the, or up to the year 91, I think up to this decision called Factor Tame, um, the national judges would have said, well, it's up to the national legal system when somebody gets interim relief or not. I mean, this is just, you know, to make it a bit quicker for them, but it's, it's not the, the main action. But, even there, the, the, the court has held, has, has said, well, no EU law influences your nas national procedural law. I, and especially where rights granted to an individual under EU law are at stake, there must be some interim relief for those people. And um, so in this case, he stated, it must be added that the full effectiveness of community law would be just as much impaired if a rule of national law could prevent a court seized of a dispute governed by community law from granting interim relief in order to ensure the full effectiveness of the judgment to be given on the existence of the rights. So, um, yeah, oh, maybe I should, should give you the facts of this case. Um, this, uh, the British, the, 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 the plaintiff here, um, Facto Tame, owned, um, owned uh, fishing vessels, oh yeah, it was a case about fishing vessels, um, that had to be registered in a, in a UK register for ships. Yeah. And the, 
the UK law on the ship register said, well, to be registered here, these vessels have to be owned by a British company. But here, these vessels at stake were owned by Spanish companies, partly. So the ships couldn't be registered, and they had to suddenly, out of a sudden, from as to the entry of, into force of this decree, they couldn't go fishing anymore under the British flag. And so um, they brought an action before the courts against this decree, saying this is a violation of EU law because it discriminates against non-British people and companies. But they were really afraid of not being allowed to fish in the next year, right? So they said, <coughs> well, we are likely to, to suffer irreparable damage. Please give us interim relief. Allow us now to, sh to fish until you have made your final decision. decision. And, but um, there was a common an old common law rule that there is no interim relief against the crown in England for some reason, yeah? You always have to, you can only do it in the main proceeding, say this is right, right or wrong, but no interim relief against the government. And this was something that the, court, the ECJ didn't like at all. So he said, no, 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 there must be a way of interim relief if somebody is relying on EU law. So this also influenced the national procedural rules. But it can also be the other way around. Well, if somebody says, um, mm, yeah, if, if somebody seeks for interim relief, although the other party is relying on EU law, you know, it can al also be sought from the other side and would have a negative effect on EU law, the interim relief. If, if somebody says, well, I'm, re re I'm relying on a national law, on my la national law, I want this and this, and the other party, the defendant says, no, 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 this is not, a, it's not, it's violating EU law. Mm -hmm. But, um, or, or, the e or even the, it's, the EU regulation is void, I don't know. Then still the plaintiff can seek for interim relief because he's likely to suffer irreparable damage. So the question is, is, that is uh, are the courts allowed to give that sort of interim relief? Mm. So that's more difficult. Of course, the ECJ is not mm. so keen on that. So he says, well, only if certain conditions are fulfilled. Well, of course, he knows interim relief is a means that every plaintiff or every defendant should, uh, sh should get because it's, it's, um, it's securing your, your right to defense and, and so on. But um, in this case, yeah, it, it was, for example, um, uh, what were the facts? Oh, the, um, the national, oh, it's a German case. Um, uh, the, the, the German authorities had levied a charge for the marketing of sugar. It's a case from the agricultural sector. They had levied a charge for the, um, for the marketing of sugar in the years 1986 and 97. And the levy of that extra charge was based on an EU regulation, which says, yeah, 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 we need an extra charge to get some, because I, I think the sugar producers are always um, funded by the EU in a way, and they wanted some money back. And, um, but the Zuckerfabrik, like the sugar factory, said, no, 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 I don't want to pay it. And, uh, or they had paid it, I think, and they wanted it back quickly. So they were seeking interim relief. And, um, and they said, well, the EU regulation, which says that you should, the authorities should claim back the money from them, was void. They said, it's, I don't know, it runs counter, I don't know, my human rights, I don't know. So um, in that case, the, the, the ECJ had difficulties with saying, yeah, you, you may get interim relief. But he, do, he says, um, the treaty does not preclude the power of national courts to suspend enforcement of an administrative measure based on a community regulation. In order for a national court to be entitled to grant such a suspension, it must entertain serious doubts as to the validity of the community measure in question, which is here this agricultural regulation, and must itself refer that question to the court, of course. So you cannot take a decision on your own, but you have to make sure that the court in the end decides. There must be urgency in the sense that the applicant is threatened with serious and irreparable damage and due account must be taken of the interests of the community. So there are several conditions to be fulfilled. So it's not so easy to grant interim relief uh, if, if it's against EU law, in a way. And um, 
And you have to apply the conditions that the, the criteria that the, e, the ECJ sets out. You cannot just, just um, um, apply your own procedural law, your national law. You have to pay attention to this. Yeah. Just to clarify, so if we have interim measures against government, our national government, then we apply national law. Uh, we, we give the opportunity, considering EU law, we give the opportunity for interim measures, but they, we, uh, um, we apply national law whether this measure is justified or not. But when we uh, are uh, discussing, uh, when we are talking about uh, these measures against EU government, uh, EU law, or, or yeah, no, it's, it's not so much a question about whether it's it's a measure of the national administration or something else, but it's more, are you granting interim relief in favor of EU law for somebody who okay. relies on EU law, like he invokes a right under EU law okay. and says, and to secure this right, give it full effectif effectiveness, you have to grant me interim relief, then the EC then you have to apply your normal rules, but you really have to grant him interim relief. The ECJ says, yes, please. There must be some way. If your national procedural rules don't give you the opportunity, then you have a problem. Then you have to, I don't know, find a way to grant him interim relief. But if you are asked to grant interim relief against EU law, and you think that, well, and, and it's, EU law is at, at stake and in danger and may, not, maybe, maybe um, not effectively applied because you say, mm, I'm not applying this, I'm giving suspension, it's, it's, I doubt it's, it's strange this, then, then you should apply the EU criteria of um, Zuckerfabrik. Okay. So, um, if I may add, uh, the, the principle is that EU law should be uniformly <coughs> applied across the uh, yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, territory of EU. So if you grant an interim relief <coughs> uh, that is valid on the territory of your state, that means the exemption of that uniform validity, uniform application of EU law across the, the, the yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, territory of EU. That's why you have to be extremely careful about that. That's why you have yeah. to apply additional yeah. criteria. So you cannot just say, oh, well, yeah. I, I, I find cares? this dodgy. Yeah, yeah I am. Um, let's, so that's. But that's the risk. It's, yeah, it's just this principle of uniform application all the time. Um, yeah, and this is, has all been very abstract. I know we've only maybe yeah, a quarter of an hour and, or 10 minutes, and then we try. Okay. Um, I mean, I know it's all very abstract because it's so, no, it's, it's no, so very special. <laughs> and it's so very special cases. But um, from this presentation, you can solve the case that I will hand out to you. And, um, Well, the thing is, I think we don't have, I only have this handout. <laughs>